again, and welcome back to DBD TV, where we cover the TV adaptations of the Dragon Ball series. If you're new to Dragon Ball Dissection, this is not my analysis of the arc as a whole. If you're interested in my thoughts on the story and characters, please go here. This video is simply to talk about changes. The TV version of the 22nd Tenkaichi Budokai arc began on October 21st, 1987, just after Piccolo Daimo regained his youth in the manga. And let me get right to the point with this video. This is one of those weird situations where I can honestly say, I didn't know. I swear I wasn't setting this up. I only just watched most of these episodes for the first time about a year ago, which was a few months after I covered this arc in Dragon Ball Dissection. So it's only by amazing coincidence that the TV version of this arc actually manages to address and fix most of the problems I experienced with the original version. For obvious reasons, that made this kind of a delight to watch. Let's start with Goku. My problem with Goku was how peripheral he seemed to the story until pretty far in. He misses meeting the main villains, so he has no idea who they are. Neither of his first two fights in the finals really contributes anything to the story, and the first one is so pointless it might as well not have existed at all. Well, as much as I like to joke about the anime introducing characters before they're supposed to be introduced, I really think they did a good service to the plot by having Goku meet Tenshinhan and Chaozu during his training. Don't get me wrong, I don't think it was an amazing or the best introduction those two characters could have had, and especially not for Sudo Senin, but it actually does stand out among other early introductions. While others have felt like a tacked-on bit before they actually do something relevant, this feels like something of a fake-out for people who haven't read the manga. These two show up in an episodic filler mini-arc, so there's every reason to believe they're just random villains of the week who are thwarted, never to be seen again, like Tenlong from a couple of episodes earlier. So what a shock when they not only come back, but are the main villains. And more importantly in terms of this arc, it makes it so that Goku already has a personal history with these people, so he doesn't just feel like that clueless guy who's along for the ride. Even Goku's stupid, boring, pointless, redundant fight with Ponputo has given some extra meat. It doesn't surprise me in the least that the TV staff would want to expand this a bit. I mean, Goku needed his own episode to fill out, and minor things like this are usually easy marks for some fluff. But here's the thing. As far as I see it, they had two choices in how they could have dealt with it. They could have either expanded the fight itself, the most obvious and often used tactic in making filler, but that would have ruined the point of it. Their other option was to expand the story around the fight, which is what they did, and I most certainly think it was a smarter choice to make. So the fight is still just as ridiculously short as in the manga, but the focus is taken off the fight itself. Instead, the threat is passed on to Panputo's scheming manager. Toei took the idea of Panputo being a decorated combat champion and ran with it, making him a huge celebrity and movie star with throngs of screaming fans, including Bluma, and as mentioned, an unscrupulous manager with his own stake in making sure his client is victorious. Wisely figuring out that Goku would probably win the fight, he decides to play on Goku's one weakness, his stupidity, and lures him away from the fight. So Goku is almost disqualified until, in one of the most amazingly ludicrous plot resolutions I've ever seen, Lunch chases after the car that has taken him away because she just bought him ice cream and is livid it might melt before he gets to eat it. But as out of the loop as Goku is in the original version of this story, my other main complaint had been how nearly everybody is removed. Yamcha, Bluma, Lunch, Puar all leave very early on due to Yamcha's hospitalization and are never seen again until the end. Well, the TV series handles this by, well, making one of the most drastic changes I've ever seen in Dragon Ball. Remember how I said in the last tournament that rather than arriving the day of the tournament and leaving the same day, the TV series had them arrive the night before and leave the day after the tournament? Well, they once again arrived the day before, that, that's standard. But for the first and only time, they stretch this tournament out, so that when all is said and done, the whole event takes four days to complete. They'll show up, fight a couple of rounds, and then just go home. In a few spots, is a little ridiculous. Take the first day, for instance. The audience is waiting for quite a while to actually see anything. Remember that non-combatants are not allowed to view the preliminaries. The TV series is exceptionally clear on that rule. Under no circumstances are non-combatants allowed in. Except for right here where the ad is seen. It's not in the manga where Tsuru Senin is right there. Good job. Where was I? Oh yeah. So the spectators have been waiting outside for Kami knows how long for the real fighting to start. Then finally, it starts. 
Match 1, Yamcha and Tenshinhan. Okay, that's enough of that. Let's go home. Really? Who would put up with that? But on the bright side, it opens the story up for much more interaction among the characters. First off, the night before segment includes a scene where Yamcha and Kururin sneak out of their hotel room, in their old clothes no less, just to run off some nervous energy before the tournament. Once the tournament gets going, there's all kinds of fun stuff. Sometimes it's as simple as the gang reconvening in Yamcha's hospital room to reflect on the day's events. Other times it's as ridiculous and far-fetched as Sudo sending breaking into Goku's room in the middle of the night in an attempt to assassinate him. Yamcha even sneaks out of his hospital room in time to watch the final match. And most of these scenes do quite a bit to add to the carnival-like atmosphere of the tournament. I said in the 23rd Budokai arc that that arc did the best job of making the characters really feel like family, of really showing them interact meaningfully together. Well, I have to say it, Toei's version of the 22nd Budokai outstrips Toriyama's 23rd in this regard, no contest. So, as much as I have a hard time believing that people would put up with the tournament being held this way, and as much as it clashes with every other tournament we'll see in the entire series, it's so worth it. Just good luck to all the fans trying to make the anime timeline correspond to the mangas with so many dates out of whack. Not everything is a real winner, though. In a pinch, they always fall back on their easiest joke, having the Muten Roshi do perverted things. And rather than trying to improve Chaozu's characterization, the anime writers stretch out his one main fight by... establishing that his head is really hard. Not that head, the one that has the curly hair. I, I mean, the one he uses the thrust with. I, I mean, I, 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 moving on. Also, according to this version, Namu comes back to compete in this tournament, and the gang has a nice reunion during a filler lunch break during the preliminaries. Oh, gee, how heartwarming. A character who doesn't appear in the original version of this arc at all suddenly shows up for a tender moment. I can't imagine where this is going. Oh! Yep, he's beaten brutally and hospitalized by Ten Shinhan in his last qualifying match in order to establish Ten as a threat and make it personal with Goku. You know, just like what he's about to do to Yamcha. Didn't we already have this problem with King Chapa and Panputo? Why are we adding in another redundant fight? Although, when you think about this in-universe, it's kind of funny. Namu gets his head handed to him, he gets out of the hospital. What a rough week! I'm going home where it's safe! Bam, killed by Tambourine. A few missteps aside, Toei does make some interesting choices with the end of the arc, such as having the crowds lift Goku and Ten Shinhan on their shoulders where they get to shake hands. It gets a bit heavy-handed with the Muten Roshi thinking to Ten Shinhan that this is what it's like to be loved by the crowds instead of hated, despite the fact that the crowds seemed to like him just fine before. And Yamcha gets to initiate a slow clap! But what I really found interesting was how differently they handled Kurudin's death. In the original, it comes out of nowhere. There's a scream, and everyone runs in to find him dead. In this version, they actually have time to follow through on their plan of getting dinner. It's only when they get to the restaurant that Goku realizes he's forgotten his stuff, and it's here that Kurudin volunteers to go all the way back and get it. And for just a moment, Goku stops him. He doesn't know why, and he shrugs it off, but for just this one eerily intense moment, Goku feels something is amiss. It doesn't really make any realistic sense, but boy does it add to the drama. It makes us feel off-kilter, whether or not we already know the story. And while it's never directly addressed, it adds a layer to Goku's pain of, I could have prevented this if only I'd said something. That said, while hazy intuition is one thing, it is a bit silly that Goku knows for certain when Kurudin actually dies, despite being far out of earshot in this version. It sure would have been convenient if his Kurudin death senses had been so finely attuned five minutes ago! But I think this is a really cool reinterpretation. Speaking of weird intuitions relating to Kurudin's death, it's not just for Goku. During Kurudin's fight with Chaozu, the TV series tries to play off the idea that Chaozu actually kills Kurudin. But it turns out it's just Yamcha having a dream. Jeez, everyone thinks Kurudin's going to die, don't they? Well, they're... not wrong. And finally, this arc does get a really awesome insert song in the form of Wolf Hurricane, a Yamcha song. Not only is it a song about Yamcha, it's sung by Furuya Toru, Yamcha's voice actor, in character, and he has a great set of pipes. It's an awesome song that makes his fight with Ten Shinhan even more fun to watch. Now, several of the actors get to sing songs in character. Most of them are on CDs. But Yamcha is the only character aside from Goku who actually gets a song aired in the show during the original run of the franchise. Gohan gets a couple in the movies. 
But interestingly, while insert songs were quite in vogue during the last arc, they largely come to an end as soon as Yamcha gets one. Insert your own Yamcha joke here. Since this arc is shorter than the last, I have time to cover the last two original main animation studios, Shindo Pro and Segasha. Shindo Pro is, appropriately enough, headed up by Shindo Mitsuo. It's a fairly decent studio at this point, but not really anything spectacular. I often hear them referred to by fans as the Evil Eye Studio because of how sharply the eyes are drawn, particularly in the late Frieza arc. While Toriyama's art style at this point isn't quite angular enough for them to get into that territory yet, the eyes still do stand out heavily. Segasha, conversely, headed up at this point by Takeuchi Tomikichi, is what I've always thought of as more of a squiggly eye style. Their eyes always look a bit smaller and kind of pinched. Segasha is definitely in the upper tier in terms of art, and they also have some really expressive animation, which I think is a really good quality. But, while I'm usually alone in feeling this way, it sometimes becomes so exaggerated that I'd also be inclined to call this the studio of the rubber people. It's hard to describe, but the characters often move in a very distinctive way. Like when some presence comes out of nowhere, the characters will stretch their necks around very slowly and then snap forward as if they're on springs. When they go in for a punch, their arms will pull back like Stretch Armstrong. Don't get me wrong, like I said, the art quality, at least at this point, is really good. But the animation is just a bit too quirky for my taste. I find it distracting. Both of these studios are going to undergo significant shifts in supervision over the course of the Dragon Ball franchise, so we'll be coming back to them later on to see how they fare. So that's the 22nd Tenkaichi Budokai arc, TV style. And as much as I liked this arc already, the TV version actually surpasses it in a lot of ways. Toei takes some good chances and it pays off for the most part. It was the surprise gem of my viewing. Next time, we're moving forward with the main series once more. It seems the world is finally at peace until a visitor shows up to change everything. In the Cyan Arc. See you there!